long and very busy day at the Vancouver Fan Expo 2013. It was uh, for a very first day. I mean, I got in there at around 8.30. No, wait, around yeah, 9 o'clock actually because I just moved down here to Burnaby and I'm still learning to get around the system, the bus transit system here, learning to connect with the SkyTrain and everything. It wasn't all that bad. Coming back, I got mixed up and I got on the right bus but when it was going the wrong way. So it took me actually about another hour longer than I thought it would getting back home. But I had a great time today. I was able to meet a number of people as well as find out that tomorrow morning, Jennifer Hill, yes, Jennifer Hill oh, of Mass Effect as Commander Shepard, she's going to be in tomorrow morning at the EP booth. So I'm going to be going in early just so that I can get in the lineup because apparently last year when she was there at the Vancouver Fan Expo, she was rather swamped. Mind you, that was about, oh man. Uh, uh, most likely, I think that was a month and a half after the release of Mass Effect 3. But nonetheless, it's probably going to happen again. First off, let's talk about some of the stuff I got. I went and got the premium two-day package, which means I got an extra, extra large shirt. Well, of course, I also got this. I got this here. I also got this wristband, which I have to keep on for tomorrow if I want to make it back in. So. Until that's done, until the convention is done, this is staying on. So I've got the, hang on here, I've got the, ah, here we go, the, let's open this up. Ugh. The extra, extra large, because sometimes I just like being comfy, I don't really like clothes that are very, very clingy. The extra, extra large Vancouver Fan Expo shirt. I mean, look at that, that is lovely. Oh, it looks beautiful. And even on the back, Vancouver Fan Expo. I think I'll wear this tomorrow. It seems seems pretty light, but nice and solid. Uh, one of the things when you go to a convention, and the Fan Expo is fairly small in compared to the Calgary Expo, which is about three times the size. The air conditioning works good, but you're still walking around and everything, and even at a casual uh, casual pace, you're kind of stuffed in with a whole bunch of people, so you're, you're going to sweat. So I got that. I also got this awesome bag, which I'll be taking with me, so that way I can probably get more swag and uh, spend more money than I probably need to. So let's take a look at some of the other things I bought. From the Soul booth dedicated to Transformer toys, I got... This guy here, all Cybertron Soundway, who turns into a kind of, yeah, a truck, apparently. And he comes with laser beak, which is awesome. I'm going to be opening him up later on today. Let's see here, let's put that aside. I've got the Sentry Turret from Portal. This is going on my desktop, right there. There's this magazine with a nice schedule and everything. Let's see here. I also got from the Artist Alley, from James Stoko, all five issues of Godzilla, The Half Century War. Now, The Half Century War is a really good limited series written and drawn by James Stoko, which uh, chronicles the uh, a Japanese man called Murakami who joins the anti-Megasaurus force and his fight against Godzilla over the space of half a century. It's really fantastic artwork and it's just a beautiful, short, sweet series. I cannot recommend this to you enough. I talked with James Stoko and he said that the trade paperback won't be out for at least another month and nice guy that he was, even though these are four dollars each, he gave all five of them to me for five bucks. So. I just may well get the trade paperback when it does come out. So I'll have it here, I'll have it in trade paperback, and of course I have it on my tablet in Comixology. So we got that. For my good friend Maya Rajani, I've got the uh, signed picture of Tom Savini. It says, to Amaya. So uh, she's going to love this. He's really going to love this. And then for my good friend, Kirk Boxleitner, I've got an autograph photo of, yes, 
Michael Rooker. And I'll tell you a little bit the Q, about the Q&A with him, as well as uh, getting that picture signed, because there's a story behind that. And then, of course, I found this really awesome uh, game, or sorry, uh, yeah, game and toy booth called Toy Traders and Collectors. And apparently, really, really good. I mean, their booth was pretty big. Considering that, you know, the Fan Expo is kind of small, it's, uh, yeah, it was really good. It, oh, it's Langley, B.C. Lord. That might be one hell of a trip for me out of Burnaby here. Uh, oh yeah, the New Image College of Fine Arts. They were actually doing a, uh, uh, a demonstration of body paint, preparing someone for a role. And they were uh, painting up, uh, must have been like a bodybuilder, as well as student and uh, model as Kratos, the God of War. It was just the amount of work that they got in putting them in the first layers of the makeup in two hours. It was intense. So I also signed up for some free scholarships because I want to try to get into acting. What else have I got here? From, let's see here, from... Oh, oh God, the uh, CNL Multimedia booth. I got not one, but two collected anime series, which are really, really good. I've got, first off, Udon High School Host Club on Blu-ray, which is uh, it's just this fantastic reverse harem series, where it's actually a group of men and one woman. And it's about basically this hard-working but poor, uh, as in her, her class, her financial class is like, um, uh, middle lower class who goes to this ultra rich school because she does so well on her tests and studying in that and how all these men really come to love love and adore her it's actually really good because it really takes apart a lot of the tropes that you see in harem anime such as this and then I got something that a friend recommended to me that I never finished but when I saw it I figured it was a great deal to get which was Burst Angel. It, it comes with all oh, 24 episodes, you know, uh, some OAVs and a ton of extras. So I got that. That was also really good. More stuff, more stuff. Kirby Crackle was in town. They're also going to be at Calgary Expo. A bunch of real cool guys. And I picked up their latest CD, which was actually a recording of Live in Seattle. They're currently playing at a bar down in uh, Van or over in downtown Vancouver, but I had to come home early because I was well, I had homework of my own to do, and so I can't wait to actually put this music in and see what it's like. So after that, there's this one little booth there, uh, GuruKitty.com. I actually bought it. It's called Once Upon a Time. Now I thought it was a graphic novel based on the TV series it was actually a series of uh, short stories in black and white that talk about well their different versions their different takes on various fairy tales I haven't read it all but I perused through it and it really looks fantastic I can't wait to see more of it read more of it let's see here some cards a lot of cards you end up picking up a lot of you end up picking up like a lot of business cards there. No, oh, the fictional comedy. Ah, man, unofficial Vancouver uh, Expo Vancouver after party. Ah, uh, sure. I really wish I had thought the goal of that. Oh, hang on. Yeah, definitely wish I had thought the the, the goal of that. Oh well, maybe next year. And of course, C N L, Cutting Edge, which sells a lot of replicas, or a lot of really sharp replicas. I got an energy drink. Zombie Survival Can. It was from this one comic book store, and it says this here, Drink entire contents to ensure speedy escape. Fill can at rocks and throw can at zombie. Uh, substitute for gas mask in case of toxic cloud. Use can to collect rainwater. Boil if necessary. And dispose the can properly. Sounds of litter can alert zombies to your presence. So just in case of zombie apocalypse. I'm not sure. Geez, 27 grams of sugar. 
That's a lot. But your basic energy drink just with a zombie flare. Very, very good. And, well, uh, more business cards. Uh, I actually gotta go, well, this, this is from an art dealer. I gotta go check them out. And now, let's get some storytelling. Because, frankly, ah, jeez. Let's talk about Michael Rooker. This, the man is a charmer. He actually came, I've uploaded some pictures on the Facebook, and he's actually got this new haircut of a distinctive mo short mohawk style. They think it has something to do with uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, which is being directed by uh, James Gunn, who's, you know, rather sexist as arse hat. Uh, but... Uh, people asked him in the panel about it, and he cannot say anything about it. He can't say anything about it. Now, we were, uh, we were in the lineup, and he's just really, really charming. Like, he's getting along with the fans. He's, like, taking pictures with them in the, in the autograph, even though there's, like, a photo ops that people can pay, pay money for later on. And just a killer sense of humor. Like, just... Oh my God, dry sense of humor. When it came my turn to, uh, and I've been asked, I also uh, talked with um, Peter Kent, who was Arnold Schwarzenegger's body devil for much of his film career, as well as, oh shoot, Ken, I can't remember his name, but he played Jason Voorhees in Jason vs. Freddy. I've been asking for advice on what to do for acting. And I asked him, what should I do for acting? And he goes, don't. <laughs> you know, like, what's, what are some basic advice for about getting the acting? Don't. <laughs> just, oh my God, just about killed me. Just uh, Everyone was laughing. And then before, even before I got to him, there was this rather lovely lady dressed up as a zombie and um, nicely endowed. This is... Not me being a pervert. This actually takes this, this is actually important to the story. So she, she goes up. She you know she says, "I love your story. I want you to autograph my chest." And she's you know, wearing a shirt and it's torn here and here and here. And she she gets signed and he signs the picture. And he goes, "Will you sign my chest?" And she goes, "Oh." And Michael Moore's like, "Oh, okay." And he, he signed cleavage, signed. Signed under here, <laughs> just not a problem. Then she got up and gave him a hug, had a picture taken, kissed him on the cheek, and he's like, "Ah, oh, thank you, darling." And he's just, I'm like, "Okay." I meanwhile, I'm like, "Oh no, I'm not looking, not looking." You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not a pervert. Just, <laughs> it's just, holy smokes. And and and, and that humor kind of continued when we were at the Q and A. It was just. Like, he, he talked about, jeez, oh, he talked about his uh, role in Slither, where he becomes this huge mutated mass. I, I haven't seen it yet, uh, but I think I probably should. But uh, he said it took something like, oh, man, seven hours, uh, seven hours in makeup chair just to put that on, and then five hours to take it off, and then he had something like, I don't know, he said, he might have gotten his math wrong on this a bit, I think. 16 hours, or no, 8 hours of filming for today. So, it sounded like a pretty intense shoot. And uh, he's just joking around with the fans. And he was actually standing up and walking back and forth. Because he said he'd been sitting down so long his butt was feeling numb. And he had a lot of great time just discussing about Merle. And just all about being on the set. He actually said that he did read the Walking Dead comic uh, when he got the part, and he called up his agent and was, what the hell? I don't see Merle in this comic anywhere. What'd you sign me on for anyhow? <laughs> and some fan, and a fan asked him, like, do you have plans about, you know, any more of Merle in the Walking Dead? He said, oh, I got lots of plans. Lots of plans. And he joked about, and then he also joked about saying if they shot any more footage, for the third season of him and Daryl, it would have become the Meryl and Daryl show. <laughs> and I think the most hilarious 
part was that uh, at the end, at the end, this young lady gets up and asks him, "Did you ever have any experiences with any crazed <laughs> fan girls?" And this was the last, very last question of the panel. So he jumps up on the table, stands up, and he gets his mic. He goes, "What have you got in my?" He goes, "Depends. What have you got in mind?" <laughs> <laughs> just like he, he it's like a really over exaggerated tone that like, you know he didn't mean it. It was just freaking hilarious. Oh god, yeah. And he actually said that in the scene where they come across Merle and he's a zombified and he's eating, and the he said that was actually barbecued meat that they, that they had given him the. Uh, to eat, which was, you know, when you think about what they did for, uh, did for, you know, like uh, Land of the Dead and Dawn of the Dead, it was basically cold turkey. When you see the zombies eating, it's like cold turkey, except on Day of the Dead, it ended up being very bad because the turkey went bad, so when people ate it for the scenes, they ended up being very, very sick. They had horrible stomach poisoning, but yeah, no, it... Ah, jeez, I honestly wish I had recorded those panels because, frankly, it was one of the best I've ever seen. And then after that, I went to a panel about the uh, AMVs that made you want to buy an anime. And there were some really good ones there. I mean, there was this great one about a magical Madoko, I think. Damn uh, I'll have to look up that name later on, and I actually kind of want to see it now, as well as Fate Stay Night, and that looks like it's a really good action series, and then I was able to attend most of a panel about voice acting, they said that you got to be really good to bring something to, uh, to the table, because the market is pretty flooded, so, but he said the good news is that, you know, there are always people who, oh, you can start any time in, in your life. That's because, well, you don't really have to have a great on-screen presence through there for your voice. And it's always good to have, it's always good to have as great a range as possible so that you can bring more to the table. And that if you do impressions, uh, I forget uh, what one of the panelists' names was, but he said, if you do impressions, it's got to be so good that if the person closes their eyes that they can imagine it's the person you're impersonating talking or so bad that it comes off as some original character that you came up with. And they gave some really good advice about coming up with demo reels. Like for a demo reel, which was a minute and 30 seconds, it's got to be something so good that in the first 10 seconds, whoever is reviewing it stops and listens, that you grab their attention. So that's 10 seconds. You have to grab the uh, casting agents or casting director's attention. And then after that, you got to have, uh, say, about six to ten distinct voices. And that there are also uh, four or five places here in Vancouver that you can go to in order to get really good demo reels done up professionally. Because, well, if you're doing it on your own, you're probably going to make mistakes that professional places won't do. And they said the cost of making a demo reel there is the cost of one full session uh, that you're paid for. So you can honestly look at it as an, like an investment you know, that you can pay off with your work later on. I had to bail out about 10 minutes early because I went to the Stanley Q&A. Uh, it was really short because Stanley had to catch a plane to leave, and this was actually the first time he had been in Vancouver for the Fan Expo. He said, the, you know, they're up here filming a lot, and for those of you who don't know, there are quite a few made-for-television Marvel movies, mostly based around the Hulk, you know, the Trial of the Incredible Hulk, and all that kind of stuff. And of course, we were always shooting a lot of the movies and everything up here. So he said this was the first time he's actually been up here, and he loves it and loves it. And of course, considering his, uh, you know, his age, he's, man, oh man, he's getting up there now. Uh, most of the questions that were re uh, asked had to be reiterated uh, to him from, by the uh, person that was up there with him, because you know, he said he can't hear as well as he used to, but his mind is sharp as a tack. I, I, 
geez, up and dies. The humor was dead on. Like he, the, his humor was such that he pushed himself as this kind of, you know, over the top egotist. <laughs> you know, but you knew he was joking. He, he, there was that tone to his voice. And, uh, uh, geez, like he said, uh, one fan asked him, like, how do you feel about, you know, your work having such an impact on people's lives? You know, not just here, but, you know, around the world, like with tales of morality and being superhero and just trying to be good people. And he said, well, it was a good thing I didn't hear about it when I was starting out. Or, oh, I said, oh, geez, my head would have been huge, would have been swelled. I, I wouldn't have been able to deal with it, you know. And he talked a little bit about the school he went to. Or it was him, Bob Kane. He, he cracked some friendly jokes against DC. Like, he wasn't putting them down, but, you know, it was just like some, you know, some friendly jokes. Like, uh, him and Bob Kane apparently went to the same school, but uh, he said, but I never got to meet him. Pity for Bob Kane. <laughs> or just things like that. And he talked about how when things were starting to get really good in Marvel, because he was also had a really strong interest in advertising, which was why he wanted to change the name of the company to Marvel. Because, you know, like, make mine Marvel. Marvel marches on. You know, like, really catchy, strong advertising. And uh, so he, he joked about how you know, uh, the age of Marvel comics and Marvel, Marvel, Marvel. And, and then he said, and then DC Comics changes their name. What do they change it to? DC Comics, which got to admit from a marketing standpoint just, oh, just doesn't quite catch us as much. I mean, <laughs> He talked about how, you know, he started off there because he figured it was at uh, the, it was Atlas Magazines. He was talking about Atlas Magazines. Now, Atlas Magazines, uh, or actually Atlas Publishing, I think it was. It was all part of this, you know, this company, and they published different kinds of magazines, you know, outdoor, outdoor magazines, men's magazines, travel, fashion, and then they had this small little line of comic books, you know, which was, um... Amazing Fantasy, where Spider-Man first appeared on, and all these other different lines of comics. And he signed on to become an assistant, because he was just starting out. And they needed assistance with the small co with the comics. So he figured, yeah, I'll do this for a couple years, I'll get some experience, and then I'll move on. Uh, <laughs> and, well, you know, that was history. And of course, he you know he, he loves all the he loves all the Marvel movies. I, I think he has a real sp a special fondness in his heart for the first Marvel movies that really hit big. That were due to the advances technology of CGI and such, just really able to bring them to life. Like uh, Sam Raimi's Spider Man. And he talked about X Men and uh, and Iron Man. I think he. It's just amazing for him to see that come to life. And he made this joke about the cameos he made. He said those movies wouldn't have been half as successful if I hadn't been in them. He said, you remember Avengers? How much money that made? You see, they put my cameo way at the end. Like where if you blinked or if you turned to talk to someone, you wouldn't see me. I'd be gone. So then you have to leave, you leave the theater like, I didn't see Stan Lee. And then you have to go back into the theater and pay more tickets and watch it again. It was just, oh man, just an intensely fun time. I, it was unfortunately only half an hour, but as I said earlier, he had to catch a plane ride home. So, excuse me, but uh, it was easily right up there, or a close second to Michael Rooker's half hour, because, I mean, just, it went like that. It was amazing. Ah, oh, jeez, just, I took so many pictures, lots of awesome cosplayers there. Oh, jeez, uh, it, was, it was really great to see, uh, and, and Astrid from uh, How to Train Your Dragon was in there, because I love that movie, uh, and, you know, I love that character. And overall, Oh, what else was there? I mean, I'm probably going to remember a lot of other stuff about Michael Rooker, but 
Oh, because I was laughing so damn hard. And, oh, Jesus. <laughs> he loves chocolate pretzels a lot. Like, he really loves chocolate pretzels a lot. I think it has something to do with mall rats. But, <laughs> oh, one fan asked him, what was your worst experience with alcohol? And, he has, he has a great sense of comedic timing. Because everyone starts laughing. Like, I don't know much about the history of Michael Rooker, but uh, apparently this is a... Th I guess this is a thing if someone asked him that and everyone just bust out laughing. And he lifts the microphone up to his face. And he was like, quiet, quiet. And he goes... And he doesn't say quiet, quiet, but everyone gets real quiet. And he goes, I don't remember. <laughs> just... Oh my God. I just wish I had a better memory for, for, for that. I should have recorded it. Oh, man. Well, I'm going to see what happens tomorrow. I just may very well record a few panels and, and such. But overall, this was a fantastic day. Oh, Stanley, uh, when people asked him what movie he wanted to see next, he wanted to see Black Panther. Pardon me. And he did say they were going to make one. Now, uh, mind you, it's, we've had people like Tom Brevoort, or not Tom Brief, but Steve Wacker going on, no, no, we can't, we can't do that, that's too contrived, and all that garbage. But, uh, apparently from what I heard, uh, or if Stan Lee says it, and Stan Lee's the one who they usually tell things last at Marvel, especially, uh, which he told us when he told us about the death of Peter Parker, and, uh, which I don't think he liked a whole lot, considering that picture of him shredding Superior Spider-Man number one. But, if he says they are going to make a Black Panther movie, and I can easily understand my friends being very critical, very doubtful of this, unless, until they've actually got the DVD in their hand, then, well, I'm, I'm going to have some faith in hope that, yeah, they're going to do it, and that if they put the effort into Black Panther that they put into their other Marvel movies, or heck, even as much as they put into Iron Man, it'll be good. I mean, I really hope it works. I really do. Oh, spe speaking of DC comics there, I just, I just remembered this. I, I'm being really half-shot because I'm thinking everything, and as I think of things, other things come to mind. <clears throat> He said, one fan asked him, how did DC Comics influence you? And he said, well, I'd read their stories, and then I have to do the exact opposite of what they did. <laughs> Jesus. He's like, he's like this awesome nerd grandpa that you, uh, Jesus. Like I said, sharp mind, really sharp, killer sense of humor. You could tell that he's been, like, just a really good showman, you know? Like, he had a great sense of comedic timing and cracking jokes and uh, listening to fans and everything. Just really fantastic. And he thanked us all for our hospitality. And well, we're, we were happy to have you there, Stan Lee. It was definitely a treat. Well, I've got some cleaning up to do around here, and I got a little bit more homework to do, but... Yeah, that was my first day at the Vancouver Fan Expo. Hopefully, I'll be able to, well, I'm going to actually do some filming at the convention tomorrow, especially as I'm standing in line for Jennifer Hale, the one and only Commander Shepard, as well as, for those of you voice actor trivia buffs would like to know, the First Lady of Gaming, Samus Aran on Metroid Prime as well as a Black Cat and Mary Jane from the PlayStation Spider-Man game, Miss Marvel from Avengers, or some Ideas Heroes, and well, just a whole bunch. You can look it all up. I'm Triple J. That's all for tonight. I am tired. I need a shower. And oh, this is one last bit. Uh, zombie paint camp. Zombie combat zone. Basically, training with paintballs for the zombie apocalypse. And love the cat. I think I have a really good look with the combat. I'm Triple J. That's all I got left to say. Take care.